This video is going to be about explaining the philosophy of champion philosopher W. V. O. Quine, but not like everything about him. Instead, we're just going to be focusing on two main visualizations I have here. One is of this large web of beliefs that we have, and the other is this idea of reciprocal containment. Now while I will be citing namely these two works from Quine himself, I will actually be doing that as little as possible, more so just when I want to be talking about the philosophic background he was working within, which I find interesting. Why only these ideas though, and why the limited citation to Quine himself? Well, basically I'm actually in reality covering a philosopher Paul O'Grady's discussion of Quine, so I should be working to keep most of my citation to O'Grady's work instead down to the line as I usually do. But O'Grady may not have offered some of the details of the philosophic background of Quine in the particular ways that I think is helpful so I need to be going to Quine's own work directly for that. Hey, wait, slow down, Wh what's going on? What do you mean, who's this O'Grady person and why bother talking about him when we're trying to talk about Quine? Well, I'm actually covering Paul O'Grady because he has what I find to be a very good discussion about a philosophic issue called relativism in a number of different interesting areas in philosophy, including logic and even rationality. Like how relative can those things even be? And Quine's work is used as a powerful resource by relativists of wide varieties, even varieties that would want to say we cannot criticize, support, or even understand each other because we live in different worlds, or that we have radically different knowledge sets, meaning nothing is shared, not even things like math or geometry, which is normally taken to be as universal regardless of our different experiences. These two are what we would call in philosophy ontological relativism and epistemological relativism. So I thought rather than cover Quine twice as O'Grady did mostly for these two chapters, why not just make one video, one video focused on just Quine himself and refer to it in both areas. So that's what this video is today and largely what's defining the scope of our discussion about Quine's ideas. That being said then, I hope it's still pretty clear that if you're not interested in O'Grady or relativism here, that's okay. You don't actually have to watch anything else even if I suggest it at times, just take it as a kind of signpost. For example, I have actually already done that video of relativism on ontology, which is our philosophy about the world, what it even is, including what kind of things exist, for example if only objects exist, or if spirits and immaterial minds exist, or if the world is composed of just ideas like an idealism. Whichever one it is, what exists, what you believe exists, the actual metaphysics of your reality, your world, that is your ontology. And believe it or not, there's actually more basis to how ontological relativism makes sense than just people wanting to believe in different things existing. There's much more thoughtful detail and philosophic complexity than a regular unfamiliar person may think. So if you think you would like to hear more about that kind of discussion, you can click here to check out that video. But of course, we are here for Quine now. So this video can definitely still be good and fun for just that. But let's be clear. 1. This video won't be perfectly all things Quine and is mostly going to rely on what O'Grady says of Quine and the range necessary for that discussion in those chapters. 2. It is absolutely possible that I might be wrong about O'Grady and his version of Quine and O'Grady can be wrong about Quine as well, though there's no reason to doubt O'Grady as he is a philosophy lecturer at Trinity College in Dublin who wrote this academic work I'm presenting right now. And in terms of doubting me, which is much more fair game, still I will be giving citation down to the line when I can, even though I think I probably could have been a little bit tighter with it this time, but uh, at least you know I'm not making this up. And when the citation does disappear though, you'll know what may be more so coming from my interpretation of what's going on here. It's just intellectual honesty, you know? Credit everyone and anything you can as best you can, and be suspicious of anyone, even an online influencer, a journalist, or even an academic professor with a PhD doctorate if there is no citation for their claims. Sorry for that, that's a little bit of a ethics lecture again I guess. Anyway, 3. I still think if you're just straight beginning to study Quine or need a refresher, this video will still give sufficient visual substance and conception of what Quine is even talking about as a guide for you to then take and make adjustments and corrections to make a more accurate presentation of Quine than I'm presenting here for your own purposes or for your students as you become more of a Quinean scholar yourself I guess, I don't know. Anyway, let's go. One, observation sentences. For Quine as an empiricist, all of our knowledge ultimately relies on observation, and for Quine in discussion of how we begin to know, we must look at how we first acquire language, initially through the sort of stimulus response type of situation. As Quine describes it, our most basic units of information, our observation sentences, which are even single word sentences, start when we are children making utterances like mama in a certain environment, like hearing that term and then being comforted by your mother or hearing it while always being in visual range of your mother. He says, a child learns their first words and sentences by hearing and using them in the presence of appropriate stimuli. 
there is a connection built from when we hear or use an utterance of a certain kind in a certain environment, repeated and rehearsed over and over enough times with enough variation to make a connection between the utterance and a set of sense impressions of an appropriate environment. And it's important here that unlike what I did earlier saying your mother, uh, that we just say sense impressions instead because we aren't saying that mama or baba for when we want the bottle let's say, we aren't saying these terms or words correspond to or point to anything. There isn't a connection of bottle to this object actually. We're not assuming there even is an object or if it's an idea or some other kind of entity behind the direct sense impressions that we receive and can be certain about. Just that this utterance which is itself a sense impression is then connected to a certain set of sense impressions that it becomes coupled with. So there's no assumption here about words and objects and how they connect to each other or meanings and minds or anything like that. None of that's going on. After all, not only are we being philosophically careful not to assume anything and sticking strictly to what we are certain about that direct sense impressions, but really when we are first learning as children, we definitely aren't coming with a theory of objects and things, matter versus spirits and minds and meanings or anything like that. There's no thinking going on. It's just sense impressions over time connecting with certain utterances. Simple, right? For these what we would call observation sentences, as Quine says, vaguely speaking what we want of observation sentences is that they are the ones in closest causal proximity to the sensory receptors. So it's kind of like nature directly causing this first input and connection of utterances to different sets of sense impressions. Again, so there's no talk of minds or even meanings going on here. From there, we build upon those observation sentences further away or less so keyed to those type of stimulus response situations with greater complexity, making distinctions for individuation, that is where one set of sense impressions or what we may be calling now objects, where one ends and another begins, or predictions, or distinctions for plurality and singleness for example, we just begin to build a larger web of our beliefs, including our knowledge theories about the natural world, like science even, thus yielding our ontology. Now you may want to say, wait, hold on, before we start talking about ontology and theory and whatever, uh, all this sounds pretty obvious, you know, like what's so special about it? Besides this whole reservation to just sense impressions, which okay, that makes sense because babies aren't assuming anything about what's behind impressions like ghosts or spirits or matter or material and immaterial or anything like that. So okay, that does make sense. But isn't that what most people sort of still think anyway? Isn't that just how scientists and psychologists describe learning? Well actually you may not have realized it yet, but what's going on is actually going to be very different from how philosophers and even how common day people take things to actually be. So this is going to be actually much more exciting than you probably think right now. But hey, let's check it out. 2. The Failures of Logical Construction Philosophers wanted certainty in our knowledge theories by grounding them in something certain. That's why we're only talking about sense impressions, sensory stimulations now, rather than making assumptions about the objects or minds or other entities behind these sense impressions themselves. And as Quine credits it, for this kind of philosopher that might do this kind of move, turn from discussions of objects to discussions about direct sense impressions, this has been like that since at least David Hume a few hundred years prior. Which is a good thing then, right? In a sense here we aren't actually assuming anything about objects or entities, still just sense impressions. But on the other hand, there's actually something circular going on in this particular way in which we're describing grounding our knowledge, if that is what we wanted to do. I mean, did you notice it? That we're actually describing this in a more of a modern scientific way to look at things. Sense stimulation, response stimulus, learning from childhood. It all already does sound like we're actually already using what we know in psychology to talk about what's happening down here. But that theory itself, psychology, was included in what needed grounding. Quine phrases what those opposing him might say in response to this, that if the epistemologist, and the epistemologist is just one who studies knowledge, but if the epistemologist's goal is the validation of the grounds of empirical science, they defeat their purpose by using psychology or other empirical science in the validation. It's like using science to show science is appropriately supported. It is showing how our theories are appropriately grounded in direct sense impressions by using our theories at the same time to show that. But this means that if it were unjustified, or let's say that if it were a bad theory, a bad knowledge theory, because say the theory isn't actually appropriately grounded in the certainty of sense impressions, 
so not validated, then we shouldn't be trusting its description of how it is itself grounded either. It's circular. And Quine acknowledges this kind of circular reasoning going on. To help if you didn't kind of catch the issue here, another way to look at it is to imagine if you're suspicious of someone and we want to verify if this person is actually honest or not. But imagine now they say to us, hey I am honest so I'm going to be telling you the truth that I am honest. That's how you can trust that I am honest. They're using circular reasoning here. Saying all this didn't actually really help us if we were suspicious of them in the first place. After all, if they were a liar, they could have just lied about being honest anyway. So a philosopher wanting to gain certainty about our knowledge of the natural world or our theories of knowledge maybe shouldn't then be using those same theories in order to support that theory. It wouldn't really provide the certainty that they wanted anyway if they started doing that. You see, philosophers wanted to and thought that they could actually get certainty in our knowledge about the natural world, our knowledge theories, by showing that they are grounded directly in sense impressions, not with that theory, which maybe we call now science, since that theory itself is what we're trying to make certain here, but with something else that is evident and certain. Logic. That is, philosophers before Quine wanted to account for the external world as a logical construct of sense data. This could have, if it had worked, provided the certainty in our knowledge that philosophers wanted. It is an alluring yet elusive prize to know with certainty for a philosopher. But as it turns out, when we took our knowledge series that we do have now, we couldn't perfectly reduce them down to that pure sense impressions level with just logic. We actually needed something else called set theory as well. And set theory, whatever it is, sorry I didn't make a video about that yet, but it isn't as great and as obvious or as evident as logic is. But even with set theory 2, still it couldn't be perfectly reduced down. And so, the hopelessness of grounding natural science upon immediate experience in a firmly logical way was acknowledged. The Cartesian quest for certainty had been a remote motivation of epistemology, both on the conceptual and on the doctrinal side, but that quest was seen as a lost cause. According to Quine, Carnap, his mentor and immediate predecessor, had the best chance of doing this type of thing, but he too had trouble in particular when it came to the information about spatio-temporal locatedness. And so for Quine, he felt this whole project is just doomed, and once we give up trying to do this sort of thing, you know, building off sense impressions with just some kind of perfect structuring of logic and set theory, then circularity isn't such a trouble to deal with, because it appears we will need something more than just that. Such scruples against circularity have little point once we have stopped dreaming of deducing science from observation. But that could leave philosophers with a bad taste because it could feel like Quine has just pretty much given up on having certain knowledge anyway. But hold on to that idea for a second. We will come back to this issue, but before we do that, let's look again at that web of belief. But how Quine does it then? 3. Building the web of belief. For Quine, instead of building with perfectly logical structures as if that were even possible as children as we're growing up first learning things, instead those observation sentences we build upon them through growing up, remember each step getting more and more refined to even more specific environments with things like individuation, prediction, and plurality. And so all these sentences and beliefs that compose our whole web of knowledge, including our beliefs about the advanced theoretical physics of black holes up here I guess let's say, or even mathematical theories we make up to help make sense of what's happening with these observation sentences is all still a part of the same behavioristic continuum all the way down to the baby's simple response. While it may seem systemic in the sense of building in some way upon those observation sentences, the building still is not actually one way, and more importantly it's not perfect. It's actually a hodgepodge kind of growth, sometimes with a guess and check type of thing going on I guess, occasionally though with corrections and clarifications over ambiguities as we build a larger structure of beliefs. It's a messy kind of growth. And so while we don't actually build up perfectly with strict logical structures, still making sort of creative or rational reconstructions of our knowledge and trying to reduce them properly with logic to those sense impressions like Carnap did, that can still be very helpful to clarify terms and reduce unnecessary concepts for us. So it is still good to do. As O'Grady says, formal symbolic logic applied to this structure for Quine is a very good way to make excellent clarifications to our web, particularly for the sciences. But as I was saying earlier, the growth doesn't seem to be just one way, up. 
It also seems to be in my visual here, I guess you could say, the growth is in a way going down as well because of theory relatedness. What those observation level sense impressions are about, how do we interpret how to connect them to each other and up, all of this is actually influenced in a way by the things on the top as well, the large general theories that we have, say our current scientific theory for example. Whether we call these different sets of sense impressions to be of objects or ideas, what have you, how we individuate one thing from another thing and what different kind of things we would even say exist is thus a result of both how our empirical observation have influenced all the way up and how our knowledge theories influence all the way down even to those observation sentences. This is called reciprocal containment of observation to theory and theory to observation. A knowledge theory about the natural world that isn't therefore perfect or certain. It's just temporarily set and is open to improvements and change, the kind where checks can be made on it even by those observations that are themselves interpreted by that theory. And so importantly for Quine in our web of belief, there really isn't anything special. There is no specially known unique beliefs, no cutoff line from one kind of beliefs versus another. It's just actually a seamless gradation from beliefs more closely keyed into those stimulus response type of situations and those that are less so keyed. Okay, maybe it still seems reasonable and normal to you, right? But actually it's already quite different, because think about it, usually even in common sense talk we would like to think that we know or that the truth of something like 2 plus 2 equals 4 is somehow a uniquely kind of different proposition or belief than say, some plants are edible. It seems closer to common sense way of speaking to think that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a conceptually pure truth that isn't relative to anyone's observations or experiences. But statements about plants are more obviously has to do with sense, a sense of touch and eating and smelling and seeing. Well for Quine sure, one of those utterances may be more so keyed into those observation sentences, but both are empirically and theoretically influenced. Neither is a unique special kind of belief from the entire web itself. For ultimately both are just utterances themselves that are more or less grounded directly into those observation sentences of utterances connected to a set of sense impressions. So wow, that's actually pretty darn different to start thinking about how math propositions, even like 1 plus 1 equals 2, that that was somehow empirically connected to really think about that. Not just for philosophers, but even from the ways we in common sense think about these things. So let's look at the impact of this even further now. 4. Everything changed. Philosophers may have previously wanted a certain kind of special beliefs, ones that are a priori true, like math, or geometry, or logic, those beliefs that are true even prior to any observation, true no matter what experience we have, versus being a posteriori, which are things that are influenced by our observation, as in post or after experience you could say. But this is not so for Quine. For Quine nothing is so special. No special philosophical sentences outside of the seamless web. No knowledge claim that observation cannot affect or change, as all beliefs and sentences are empirically contained. None are wholly conceptual. So this is a pretty out there move by Quine, called naturalized epistemology. I would guess it's a closer reliance to empiricism, our sense impressions, than even for the common sense common day person might have thought. So remember that possible bad taste that I mentioned where it seems like we had possibly given up on certain knowledge? For philosophers still rather carrying a kind of Cartesian influence without certainty, if it's possible that we can even be wrong, then we don't really even have knowledge at all. And it seems like we are openly admitting here that our theories are fallible and open to change, definitely not certain. Well, Quine references Neruth's boat in this regard, and I will talk about this boat a bit more in my next video about epistemology, but basically the ship as a whole, representing our whole web of beliefs as a whole, does provide us with knowledge, a kind of certainty that we can have in any of our utterances because of the whole itself, despite the fact that any one piece can be removed and replaced. It's actually a very beautiful image of how we can actually stay afloat despite the fact that any one piece can be changeable but it is rather different from the kind of image perhaps more akin to the one desired by philosophers prior. An image that I'm just gonna make here but based off the kind of words many use to describe this older desire for an edifice. A building, a strong clear precise structure grounded in the actual ground, something solid, something certain, as if to maintain that certainty of the ground itself as we're building upwards to the heavens. Which in a way this may still be much more preferable than that boat floating on a slippery fluid doubtful waters or whatever. It may be a fantasy, but a desirable one 
to be anchored in some way, or as I may have described it, to have a lighthouse. <laughs> Sorry about that, I have something in my eye. Or do I? In any case for Quine, it's not that all beliefs are equally replaceable, just that with some beliefs we don't have to make that many adjustments in the web to remove them, but with others trying to remove them may have effect all the way throughout the web. And so it's not a matter of certain sentences being a priori truth and immovable and absolutely certain, it's just a matter of willingness and we are just less likely, less willing to try and remove certain beliefs that would cause massive damage throughout the entire web. Nevertheless though, it is still always possible. So there's lots of room here for the idea that we could have over time completely different webs of belief here. Completely different in all its theories, even about what we thought were a priori. So keep that in mind. It's much more fluid than previous philosophers even wanted. But for Quine is still sufficient in keeping us afloat with knowledge. Before we go on, I just wanted to make a quick point here that for O'Grady, he seems much more interested in talking about this in terms of the a priori, a posteriori distinction being taken down by Quine because now there's nothing that's a priori, but Quine is most notable for taking down the analytic synthetic distinction. Those are actually different distinctions and there are more details of this, but it still works much in the same picture. So I'm just going to leave up this quote from IEP. If you do want to pause and read it, that's up to you just to kind of help explain why this is seemingly interchangeable for Quine and possibly other empiricists. And tell you that this is a controversial point, but I'm noting it here to explain why even though Quine is notable for taking down the analytic synthetic distinction, why I'm using a priori mostly. It's because of O'Grady, and maybe to account for certain ways I might be phrasing the a priori. I don't think we really need to get into the details of this distinction though, just something to note. Oh, and just because reciprocal containment may be thought of as in some way circular by those opposing Quine, that doesn't mean that all kinds of circularity is therefore acceptable by Quine, as it is in main part how he takes down analyticity. Anyway, so those distinctions of what we take as a priori is just that which is given much more immediate assent by our community in terms of using a certain utterance. In fact, for Quine, some scientific truths may be as deeply entrenched in our web of belief as certain math truths, so in that way they could have the same epistemic status to us. I suppose as an example for this, if I had to make one on the top of my head right now, uh, don't, don't think this has an opportunity for you to attack me, I'm just trying to think of an example here for to make this more believable, uh, but basically imagine somebody asking, does water exist? Water is an utterance with such a long and important history in our connection and having so many connections as we grew up, and also one that is very important to our very survival. Well, that utterance of water could be so deeply entrenched in our web of belief that somebody may react to this question like, yeah, obviously, what do you even mean? Of course water exists. And they may do so with the same visceral reaction of obviously water exists that they may have had with an utterance of a less familiar math proposition in calculus, let's say. So everything in our web of belief is empirically contained, but also theoretically contained. And that is what we called reciprocal containment, remember? Well, for Quine, this maps onto how ontology and epistemology are reciprocally contained as well, what exists in our world, and what our knowledge theories are. Again, this is what philosophers critical of Quine would have likened to circularity. But as we have already discussed, he feels there's just much more hope to this kind of reciprocal containment than to proceed while attempting to avoid circularity. Because that old way of trying to build straight off sense impressions with just straight logic and possibly set theory as well, well that just didn't work. And if we are simply out to understand the link between observation and science, we are well advised to use any available information, including that provided by the very science whose link with observation we are seeking to understand. So despite the possible criticism of reciprocal containment and the lack of certainty that we may have wanted in our knowledge theories anyway, despite the fact that we now have something much more fluid, it seems like Quine is just making the case that this is just necessarily what we have to do given that we cannot use those old ways. They didn't work. So we're going to need something. We're going to need our knowledge anyway to help us figure out how it was grounded. Or you know, something like that. But now let's crucially turn to our discussion with O'Grady. Back to that earlier point we were making. 5. How different? 
because we can have different observations and different theories even based off those same observations given something called underdetermination which unfortunately I'm not really getting into right now. Anyway, the fact is that our theories can shape those observations too and so anything can change. And also because anything can change, there is no a priori or certain belief and there's plenty of room in Quine to say that we can have different webs of beliefs, even whole webs that are radically different from one another, which leads to therefore epistemological relativism. No universal knowledge at all, not even things like math or other a priori utterances. In fact, in the Quine way of viewing things, our possible insistence on some pure transcendent access to knowledge beyond our senses and experiences makes us sound like actually we're the spooky mystical ones to someone who's more of a strict empiricist in philosophy. But the reason we may feel this way is because of the assumptions we have about the way language works, whether it is 2 plus 2 equals 4 or if it's about ghosts existing or not. We may have already preset our kind of view on language and words and meaning and how they have connections to objects or not and such, so one really does have to keep in mind that here for Quine it all breaks down to simply utterances in connection with certain sense impressions. It doesn't really matter how we feel or the theories that we actually have behind what we think the words are doing just so long as these certain utterances themselves are appropriately used in connection to certain external stimuli. But again that's leading me into underdetermination and well I really don't want to start talking about Gava Guy right now. <laughs> Even if that can be made more important in terms of what we're trying to talk about here, still I think it's good enough for us to be able to move on. So that was epistemological relativism. But what about that ontology now? After all, one's ontology is basic to the conceptual scheme by which they interpret all experiences, even the most commonplace ones. Well, in terms of ontology, as O'Grady notes, and I hope you don't mind me just reading straight reading a few lines here, but as O'Grady says, unlike the traditional kind, which attempts to articulate the ultimate nature of reality independent of our theorizing, Quine's realism takes on board the view that ontology is relative to theory, and specifically that reference is relative to the linguistic structures used to articulate it. Furthermore, there will always be alternative ways to present evidence, to produce a different ontology. There is no fact of the matter, outside the theory, forcing on us a particular ontological interpretation. What determines one's choice of ontology are methodological factors, such as simplicity, generality, predictive power, conservatism, and so on. Depending on one's choice of theory, there will be different ontologies. Ontological relativity, therefore argues that ontology is theory relative. The basic contention is that the argument impinges on the choice of theory when bringing forward considerations whether one way of construing reality is better than another. It is an argument about which theory one prefers. Whatever ontology we accept derives from whatever theory we accept. So our best theories here in our web of belief actually reveal our ontology, our theory of what exists, what there is, what our world is even made of. So in that sense, our ontology is relative too. This implies that in one conceptual scheme, there very well could be utterances about ghosts and spirits that would be taken to exist with as much meaningfulness as anything is said to exist at all, as much as it might be said that objects or matter exists in another conceptual scheme. This may be quite extreme, or Quine extreme. Okay, never mind, philosophy. But it's important to note that Quine actually feels that there is one particular theory from our web of belief which is the best for the sake of having the widest scope of being beholden to the observation terms for explanation or predictive power and also in terms of simplicity, for example, and that this bestest of all theories for Quine is actually the physical sciences. So despite the seeming fluidity, he actually prizes science and physics a great deal if you can't tell already. Quine done loved him some science for sure. And he would say that whatever our best theory of the world is, which entails our world being a certain way, that is our ontology. That is what we would take as the truth. So let's look at philosopher Paul O'Grady's kind of response to this sort of thing, and a couple of things he notes. 6. Tension and Meanings So based on what I just said in the end of the previous section, this becomes one of the two things O'Grady criticizes in Quine's work. One is this tension, brought up in two different places, both here and here. 
its attention and how much of a resource Quine is for relativism. Being fluid and open where nothing is special, while at the same time, physics or the physical theories are specially prized by some kind of metric or that criteria which we mentioned. And it's kind of as if that criteria itself then is supposed to transcend the web of belief in order to evaluate different theories from a different conceptual schemes to say that one is best or better. Like what's the epistemic status of this metric itself then? Anyway, that's something to think about. But there's also this other tension of how it seems that logic seems to be treated as especially evident and obvious by Quine, as discussed in the logic video. Now that logic video, by the way, you are definitely welcome to watch. I think it's an exceptionally good video for somebody newer to some more analytic philosophy, let's say. It starts pretty slow, but it does get much more gripping as you go along, so it's still pretty good for somebody even more familiar. But anyway, then, it's this tension in Quine's work between nothing being a priori or special and yet physics or logic being prized in certain ways by Quine that O'Grady addresses in logic and in the ontology chapters that he has of his. The other criticism is that dropping the a priori a posteriori distinction loses an important meaning belief distinction at the same time. One that he feels is actually very useful for philosophers to use even if it isn't really a harsh distinction between the two and even if that meaning is just fallible and in some way temporarily set only. Which I didn't really get into this type of criticism in the epistemology chapter but personally I did think it was a promising point against Quine as well. Not that I'm, I'm anybody or anything, you know, it's not like my opinion here matters too much. I'm just a shadowy nobody after all on the internet, right? <laughs> As yet. Subscribe. I'm serious. I'll wait. I'm just joking, you, don't, you can do whatever you want. Anyway, also important in terms of the epistemology chapter for O'Grady's discussion of Quine, in addition to how he has this kind of coherentist system of belief, by this reciprocal containment, Quine also feels that he can answer doubts within this web of belief with answers within it. Since philosophy isn't separate or something special from science itself, then doubts within it are kind of scientific doubts and so they can be answered by also scientific answers. For example, doubts about illusions can be answered by the study of the optics, for example. Doubts in our knowledge theories are answered by our knowledge theories. That it is a kind of overreaction to take those doubts in specific places, let's say, and try to push it to a global scale about all of knowledge. Anyway, so that's my video right now. I'm really running out of time. I really hope this was quick enough for you to still enjoy and even if you didn't like certain parts, it moved along fast. Anyway, check out Paul O'Grady's book if you can. I think it's pretty good. Not that I agree with everything happening in his book. I definitely probably will end this series with a little bit of my own reflections on what I don't particularly like or what I think he could have done better. Anyway, but also that way you can criticize him directly instead of me. Meanwhile, you definitely can go watch some other of my videos. I promise that they have so much more of the awesomeness than even this one ever could even come close to. Anyway, you can start this series about relativism if you want from the beginning. I'll have the playlist here for you. It'll be like doing a little philosophy course yourself once I'm done this whole series and you watch it from beginning to end, I reckon. Anyway, if you like this video, you don't really have to like it, but I much would appreciate it. Anyway, let's look at just what we should take from this Quine video. 7. What should we take from this video about Quine? Well, we should take a few images. One is the web of beliefs that we have here, which is a coherentist picture. Nothing is special, no a priori, and no analytic synthetic distinction. All is empirically contained, and reciprocally everything is theoretically contained as well. From observation sentences to theory, and from theory back down all the way to observation sentences. Two, this maps onto how ontology and epistemology are reciprocally contained as well. There's like a mutual contribution happening here for all of our beliefs. And some philosophers may not really like this because it sounds like circularity to them, but Quine has good reasons showing a history of failures, and when we let go of trying to go off straight sense impressions with just straight logic, let's say, then it's not so bad. But also, three, then this web actually produces what we say exists what kind of things exist, what the world is even made of, the web of belief itself, our conceptual scheme, will produce our ontology. And now for our purposes with O'Grady, one ontology therefore is relative to our theory and it seems since our entire knowledge theory can change and be completely different, thus so can our ontology. Two, Quine nevertheless prizes a physical theory and it entails a certain ontology and this is a kind of tension that O'Grady addresses in his work. 
3. Skepticism in the web therefore can also be answerable within that web a la science due to the fact that this is not a question begging thing to do anymore because of reciprocal containment. 4. Dropping the a priori, however, may have dropped the meaning-belief distinction, which invites criticism according to O'Grady. Oh, oh, one more, one more, one more, uh, important point, super important for my coin video, uh, thanks. Thanks.